everyone. Welcome to the ESG webinar, Online File Sharing and Collaboration in the Enterprise. My name is Caitlin and I will be your host. The trend towards consumerization marches onward in IT as more and more end users are choosing their own hardware platforms and software applications in lieu of the IT-sanctioned business tools provided by their companies. Do you know what questions you should be asking your vendors when evaluating online file sharing and collaboration tools? Let's find out. But first, I have a couple of housekeeping items to review. Terry and Christine's presentation should only take 45 minutes. Afterwards, they will take questions. Throughout their presentation, please feel free to enter your questions using the control panel. In addition, we are recording today's webinar and will be posting it on the website along with all of Terry and Christine's other work at esg-global.com. With that said, I would like to introduce Terry and Christine. Terry is an ESG senior analyst with more than 20 years of storage industry experience. Christina is a research analyst at ESG helping Terry cover the online file sharing space. Okay, ladies, take it away. Thanks very much, Caitlin. Hi, everybody. This is Terry McClure. Um, for the next 30 minutes, as Caitlin said, we're going to take you through some of the changing storage landscape and take a look at uh, how consumerization is really changing how we do storage in the enterprise. And as we look back over the last couple of decades, it's it's really been a fascinating fascinating to watch technology trends. I mean, when I think back, you know, well, 20 or so years ago, I've been in the workforce for a while. Um, I look at the role technology played when I first came into the workforce, and you know, I used to go to work and come home and say, you know, hi, honey, you wouldn't believe the really cool tools I get to use at work today. I had this, you know, I have a PC on my desk. I've got this pager that, you know, lets me to work 24 hours by 7. I've got these really cool tools that I use at work that I'd really love to use at home. But now, over the last couple of years, things have really changed. Um, we've really seen it so that I've got these really cool tools that I get to use at home that I want to use at work. Now I've got, well... <laughs> I've got a lot. I've got a, uh, an iPad. I've got an Android tablet. I've got uh, a smartphone. I've got a PC at home. I've got my laptop. Okay, I've got seven endpoint devices, I'm embarrassed to admit. I've got a lot of endpoint devices. And now things have really changed. I'm coming into work and I'm talking to my IT department and I'm saying, hi, honey, look at all these cool tools that I've got at home that I really want to use for work because they give me mobility and portability um, and they really lighten my load a lot. I mean, I'm not going to carry a PC around. So IT's really got some challenges uh, in uh, how they're dealing with the tools that we use to be product productive in the enterprise. But that's really creating some interesting challenges. Right. So like Terry said, this consumerization trend is really, really changing how we access and manage our data. Um, last year, we did a consumerization study to look at exactly how those things were changing. And what we found was 55% of companies we surveyed um, support BYOD. They support a bring-your-own-device policy. That's a lot. That's more than half. 83% of those uh, authorized employees to use those devices for personal and corporate applications. 40% of them um, allow employees to access and receive or store company confidential data on mobile devices. And over a third of them allow employees to access, receive, or store customer and regulated data. So customer data meaning financial data, any personally identifiable information, um, and regulated data being any data subject to security and privacy regulations. So I'm wondering if anyone in the audience is hearing any alarm bells going off in their heads yet. Um, these changes are starting to bring up big concerns and challenges with, with uh, IT and the line of business and users alike. The first um, of which is data security and control. This one's obvious, right? Um, ESG finds year after year security and control to be the number one inhibitor to cloud adoption. Um, the second is data portability. So if I'm on the road, how can I access or send my presentation to you know, a client or coworker from my tablet or smartphone? And if you think back to sort of the history of how we um, have shared files, there once was something called a floppy disk, right? <laughs> Um, and that has slowly evolved into, um, I think, what we would use now as a USB stick. Um, and the last I checked, you can't connect to, you can't connect your USB stick to your iPad. So what is the next easiest way around that is to email, email your files, email your presentations. So um, the next thing is version control. Everyone struggles with that. Terry mentioned 
last week that when she was wrapping a project, there was a, a final version, a final final version, a final version 25. So <laughs> there's lots of versions out there to manage. Next is uh, true collaboration. So apart from saving and sharing files, can you edit your documents with coworkers? Um, what does collaboration really mean? And then the last is data growth and sprawl. So data is continuing to grow. It's not going to stop. Um, now that we're accessing data on multiple endpoint devices, there's multiple copies, there's multiple versions, and email, you know, emailing files to, to everyone is kind of perpetuating that. So these concerns are really leading to some big changes in IT. You know, it would be a mistake to look at consumerization alone in, in a vacuum because, you know, there are so many trends that are impacting IT today that we need to look at in a, as a whole to understand what's really going on and what's really possible in IT. I mean, we just talked a little bit about consumerization and, you know, we've, we've got some great research in this area. You know, a third of the companies that we researched, that we spoke with last year, are actually changing application development to support bring your own device uh, policies. But... It's not just consumerization that's affecting IT today. I mean, you can't get away from, I mean, you can't get away with looking at anything now without seeing something about the cloud. And um, our IT spending intention survey for this year says that 74%, three, quarter, uh, three quarters of the organizations we spoke with are going to actually increase cloud spending in 2012. So we're certainly seeing a, a greater willingness to adopt some level of cloud technology in the enterprise. And the other big thing you can't get away, away from nowadays is, is the whole big data discussion. And we can't ignore the fact that, you know, file sizes, file densities uh, are just, they're growing, they're richer. We've got new technologies that enable us to just create these very you know, large files and huge data stores that we have to deal with being able to store and share. And this is, you know, not necessarily a business fact, but kind of a, a fun fact that TiVo says that there's going to be a, a 10x increase in HD capacity versus standard definition. And think about that. That that TiVo is completely enabled by the cloud. I mean, bandwidth has become so ubiquitous that we can um, use access big data on, on our all of our endpoint devices. So this these three tens, trends really need to be looked at holistically in what they enable for the enterprise. But but how are these three big trends affecting IT? Well, from, from kind of a macro level consumerization we just saw is really creating a new design point for IT. IT has to start building around um, supporting all of these assorted endpoint devices. Um, and the cloud is really opening up a whole bunch of new consumption and delivery models for IT. It's, it's, it's enabling IT, IT to look at doing things they've never been able to do before because, you know, we, we've solved, maybe not completely solved, but a lot of those last mile challenges are behind us in the more developed countries. And then, you know, big data really forces new ways of thinking because uh, when you start looking at big data, it can really you know, break our old ways of doing things. The files are just bigger than what we've designed our infrastructures to support. But what really, when you really look at how these three technologies come together, it's really at the center of these three technologies where we start seeing um, what's enabled, um, what's, what's really enabled the online file sharing collaboration market that we're talking about today. So this market uh, of enabling all of these endpoint devices enabling IT to exploit these trends in consumerization and cloud and big data, we call the online file sharing collaboration market. It's made up of vendors like, you know, Dropbox and Box and SugarSync, some, some you know, pretty well-known names out there that are pretty much uh, becoming, uh, well, as I said, well-known. Everybody kind of knows who Dropbox is nowadays. Uh, we define this market as a software-as-a-service offerings that that help customers share and access documents and other files in the cloud, allowing for easy access by and collaboration across multiple endpoint devices. This is the software that solves that problem of me having seven endpoint devices and wanting to access that one file, that one version of the truth from any device at any time and not have to worry about all of those, which, 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 which device has the most recent, recent version, uh, or emailing it from one device to the next. And it's been it's been pretty interesting to track this market over time. Uh, Christine and I took a really good look at this market last year for a market landscape report. And what we found is that the market's evolving very quickly, but it's really coming from two separate places. Uh, like consumerization, it's starting with 
consumer-based services that were designed for you know people like me to share my music files amongst my devices or my pictures amongst my devices really designed for this data portability across my endpoint devices and with a with a copy in the cloud and without you know really having any administration and control so the market really started for, with these consumer based offerings um, that are incredibly easy for end users to, to to manage and access i mean it's just like any other it's just like having it's like it's it's using my PC basically. It's very very simple, uh, with broad device support, and it it allows it me to synchronize my files between the cloud and my devices, so that I've got a copy in the cloud that's automatically downloaded to my PC or my laptop, or that I can access from from my tablet or my smartphone. Um, most of these are freemium models that that give me some capacity free. And they've seen very, very broad adoption. As I said, Dropbox is pretty much an everyday word nowadays for people. Um, the other end of the market that we found, the other products that we found, are those that were created from the ground up, not for consumer markets, but for business use. So these products really are focused on administration and security, um, tracking data, managing permissions, you know, provisioning and deprovisioning accounts. They're focused on uh, enterprise application integration. Uh, so how well do they plug in with uh, Salesforce.com or with my with Outlook uh, or uh, with my Microsoft products that I might be using in the enterprise? Um, we're seeing broadening device support, and more and more of these business offerings are starting to offer functionality like the consumer offerings, such as Sync, but it's it's uh, not as far along as those. But we are starting to see more and more Sync and Share. And a lot of them had collaboration designed in, but online in their web in their web portals uh, designed in from the start. But where we're really going to start seeing things come together and what's really going to catapult this market is when we start to marry these two things. When we can find solutions that bring together the ease of use of the consumer designed offerings and the administration control and security of the business designed offerings, that's really what we think is going to start catapulting uh, this market even faster than it's already going. But this is really, really important. Uh, and if there's one thing that you take out of this presentation and remember, um, it's that these online file storage and collaboration solutions, whether you want them to be or not, whether you're, evol whether you're evaluating them for use in your enterprise, they are already in your enterprise. Uh, I was actually speaking at a conference a couple of weeks ago to a bunch of IT professionals, and I bet those of you on the line are, pro I, I'd be willing to guess, are probably equally as guilty of this. <laughs> I asked the people in the room how many endpoint devices each of them had, and, and the average uh, attendee had four endpoint devices they were using for data, uh, for business data. And I asked how many were using these online file sharing collaboration solutions. Everybody in the room was using them. I think there's no surprise there. And asked how many people in the room were using unsanctioned by IT, not sanctioned solutions. And most of the rooms was using unsanctioned solutions. And these were the IT professionals. So think about this. Think about how many people across your enterprise are using unsanctioned solutions like Dropbox or Box or SugarSync or, or one of the other, um, you know, freemium based models that are out there that are designed for, that uh, were initially uh, opened for consumer use. The thing to remember is that when these people are using these unsanctioned solutions in the enterprise, account ownership stays with the person, I'm sorry, the data stays with the person that owns the account. So the key here is that if, if I'm the subscriber to the account and I leave my company, my file, my data, everything on my laptop, on my desktop, on, on my iPad comes with me. And there's really not much you can do about it. I mean, you can take some legal action, I suppose, um, but that's pretty darned expensive and uh, time-consuming. You have no idea what data I have on there. You can't deprovision the account. There's there's nothing you can really do. The data comes with me. It's it's mine because I own the account. Um, which is why it is really, really, really important for IT to start looking at these solutions and provide an IT sanctioned solution, a corporately endorsed solution for the enterprise, because once you put those in place, you have some amount of control. I mean, nothing's going to be perfect. Uh, somebody that's completely dedicated to stealing your data or getting their hands on your data or, or, or doing something 
you know, not entirely honest with your data is, is going to find a way to do it. But if you own the account, then you can start looking at, you know, auditing what they've done with data in there. You can provision the account and more importantly, deprovision the account. When somebody leaves the company and IT owns the account, you can, with a lot of these solutions, do a remote wipe functionality that goes out to the online file and wipes all the data out it and reaches its little tentacles out to all the endpoint devices and wipes all the files out of those devices. So you have some level of control if IT owns the account. And that's why this market is so critical, because the, the solutions are already being used in your enterprise. Um, and you need to get your arms around controlling the data that's out there because you don't want the data to leave with your employees. Uh, and we've actually been, you know, tossing around some names. We, we're calling it for now IT's consumerization compliance conundrum because it can create some huge compliance issues when you start thinking about the amount of regulated data that Christine mentioned earlier is on these endpoint devices, the amount of, of proprietary corporate data that's on the end, these endpoint devices. You have no way of knowing what's out there if the end, if, if, if your uh, employees own their own accounts. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm beating this point home because it is the most important point in the entire presentation. Uh, so that said, if you're evaluating these online file sharing uh, and uh, collaboration solutions, it's really important that you spend a long time uh, and go through a very thorough checklist of items to evaluate. So that's what Christine's going to take you through some of the things you should be thinking about now. Right, so just like Terry said, we're seeing sort of an intersection between um, solutions that came from sort of a consumer offering base and solutions that uh, were designed with enterprise uh, offering in mind. And with that, there's obviously going to be a little bit of confusion. So the next two slides represent sort of what we believe to be the key criteria for evaluating these vendors. Um, the first of which is just, what's the basic offering? Does it allow for syncing, sharing, collaboration? Um, will it support your mobile devices? Things like, does it limit your file sizes? Um, if you work in the entertainment industry with, you know, videos or multimedia, um, this will probably be a problem for you. Pricing models. Um, it's really hard to do an apples to apples comparison. Um, and that's one of the reasons why there are so many bullets on these two slides. Um, everyone does their model a little bit differently. Some charge by seat, some charge by capacity, um, some charge for add-ons like training or support. And then there's, you know, the different deployment models. There's public versus private versus hybrid. Um, if you're looking at a solely public cloud-based offering, that's fine. But is your company comfortable with that? Um, you really want to choose one that's suitable to your comfort level. In terms of administration, um, here's where we really run into not only does the product need to be really easy to use, but it needs enterprise governance as well. So is it easy to provision or deprovision users? Um, IT wants to know if they can, they can dictate sharing collaboration policies. Um, does the vendor provide audit reports? Also, um, in terms of integration with existing IT applications and tools, um, will it plug into Active, Active Directory so you can assign group policies? Does it have user group quotas? Um, if you're on a licensing model that's based on capacity, you definitely want to make sure you're using something that will allow you to set user and group policies. You know, Otherwise, you run the risk of having everyone's iTunes MP3s in there and supported by the solution. So next is availability and support. Um, does the vendor offer versioning? We talked about that a little bit already. Does the vendor offer SLAs? Um, do you need SLAs? Uh, and then what kind of support do they offer? So we've seen vendors that range from having online FAQs only um, to those that have dedicated support for enterprise customers. So if you're making the switch from a traditional storage vendor, um, you want to take note here because chances are you're probably used to a certain level of support and that online help might not just cut it with you. Uh, and then finally, uh, security. It's on IT's mind all the time. Uh, Terry mentioned what we're sort of calling the consumerization compliance conundrum. Uh, the data goes with the account owner. So if you're in IT, you want to know, uh, you know, what options does the vendor offer for ensuring security of the data and security for the company. Um, Terry mentioned remote wipe. 
some solutions have that. Um, and then lastly, are you in a regulated industry that requires HIPAA or some sort of other compliance? Uh, there's a ton of stuff to consider on this list. It's a lot, but they're really things that you need to pay attention to. Uh, thank, thanks, Christine. That's, that's a long list. There's a lot of things up there uh, that users need to be uh, concerned about. Um, we actually took a look at a bunch of vendors in this market space uh, last year, as I said earlier, uh, and we published a market landscape report that looked at what was then the top eight vendors in this space. And uh, we looked at this list of questions and we um, we documented how they uh, meet these criteria. And we evaluated their enterprise capabilities. So how far along are they in application integration? Do they have uh, published APIs that can be integrated with enterprise applications? Are they working with uh, developers uh, in, in, in partnership to roll out new enterprise application integrations? Um, do they uh, uh, have the level of administration and security in the Active Directory plugin? We also, so we looked at their enterprise capabilities and we looked at their enterprise market readiness, uh, with market readiness being, you know, do they have the business structure in place to be able to support enterprise users from, you know, uh, everything from support to the sales force that's required uh, to the programs, the reseller programs in place to really be able to make uh, a play in the enterprise. And we plotted them, them on this this two by two grid that you see in front of you right now uh, based on the answers to that set of questions. The box size that you see on this is based on how many users they have, end users they have, not necessarily paid users and not necessarily business users. One of the challenges with these markets is it's really hard to figure out how many of the, their subscribers are business subscribers because, darn it, there's so many of these unauthorized solutions being used by business owners using their business emails and business accounts. So it's really, you know, those with the freemium models, uh, it's really hard to tell how many business users they have versus uh, individual consumers, but uh, you can see the markets, I mean, there's there's 50 million Dropbox users out there. That's the baseline that you see on the bottom left. Uh, so when I said it's in the enterprise and it's pretty much become a day-to-day -day term, that's why. Uh, now, when you're evaluating solutions, you may not necessarily need somebody that's developed, fully developed the enterprise support capabilities or the enterprise uh, functionality out there. Uh, you could be a smaller company that doesn't need 24 by 7 support. You could be a smaller company that doesn't need all the integrations that these other guys have, have invested in. So uh, there's a lot of things that you need to think about out there. But the uh, net net of this slide is that the, the solutions are still all over the spectrum. And chances are there's, there's if you ask the questions that Christine just took you through in that checklist and match them up and, and weight those criteria that match your requirements, um, the solutions are all over the spectrum, and I'm sure that, that, that there's something out there that'll be pretty well su suited for what you need. Um, what's really interesting about this market is when we looked at it last December and we uh, published our market landscape report, uh, we narrowed it down to eight vendors. We didn't look at the vendors that had online backup solutions, and uh, you know, for that matter, we, we looked at those that just focused on collaboration and file sharing. And we narrowed our list down to, to eight. Uh, in the few months since we published that report, all of a sudden we've had an awful lot of vendors join the market. In fact, we're tracking, <clears throat> excuse me, we're tracking more than 20 vendors in this market today. We've, we've seen the number of vendors that we track more than double since we published our report in December. Uh, this is a really hot, mar hot market, as I, as I said. It's, it's a growing market. It solves some, some key problems in the enterprise. Uh, IT needs to be able to get in front of the challenge because, because, because the data leakage scenarios that unauthorized accounts promote. And a lot of these vendors that you just see coming up on the screen uh, have those business case usages. They're focusing, vendors like FileTrack out there, are focusing on administration, control, data tracking, and, and management, and auditing. Um, kind of those things that IT is really worried about when it comes to data, data loss prevention and, and, and leakage. Uh, and it's not, these other vendors aren't the only ones that are in the market. There's more coming up every single month. It's a big market. It's a hot market. 
the, the trick really is going to be for those vendors that can marry kind of the ease of use that you see out there with Dropbox and the administration and control that IT needs for that, that's more used to the traditional command and control and security policies uh, they need to enforce. I mean, IT is in charge of enforcing the corporate data policies, uh, but if the solutions that you endorse are easy enough to use by the end user, the end users are going to keep using those consumer grade solutions. So the real winner in this market is going to be the one that can, can truly marry that ease of use with the administration and control. Uh, and as I said, there's a number not public yet, but it's certainly a market that we're keeping an eye on and that we're going to keep publishing on moving forward. Right, so just like Terry said, it's a hugely dynamic market. Um, and, and with this emerging market, we're, we're keeping our eye on a couple of trends that we're seeing. The first of which is that there's starting to be competing requirements um, between business users and uh, IT. So on one hand, you have business users that have more and more mobile devices. Um, they're accumulating them. I think Terry said the average user has three or four. Um, and they all want 24-7, easy-to-access data. On the other hand, you have IT who wants to make sure that the data and the company are safe. They want control, they want administration, and they want security. So the next thing that we're, keep, that we're kind of seeing is the investment justification battle. So we're used to looking at justification in a sort of dollars by, by gigabyte terms. Um, the online file sharing solutions market doesn't really work that way. It's not to say you're not going to be reducing your costs, um, but you you may see your cost per gigabyte go up. Where you're actually going to see that the savings come from is from productivity. So think even in the event of a device failure, you can still access your presentation or your data um, somewhere else. We think this is there's really going to be a material market impact here. You know, in, in end user discussions I've had, I've spoken to, to quite a few end users that have actually deployed corporately endorsed solutions across their enterprises. And one of the big drivers that we see here is just the ability to eliminate the VPN requirement. Uh, if, if, you know, <laughs> uh, a VPN can be, uh, can present some performance challenges. Uh, and it can be expensive to maintain. And one of the big drivers that we hear from these end users is that they uh, are adopting this so that they can eliminate that requirement to log into the VPN for people to get at their file shares. Um, and interesting, Christine just mentioned the, the uh, data availability issue. It would be interesting to watch the impact on the data client side, data protection side here. Because when you think about it for your for this online file sharing collaboration market, I can I can lose one of my endpoint devices, but I can still access my data. Uh, in fact, just a personal story, last year, I, I'm a user of a number of these solutions, and last year my laptop crashed. Um, and when I think about what I would have had to have done previous to these solutions, I would have been completely stopped in my tracks from a work standpoint. I'd have had to, I was working from home, so I'd have had to hop in my car, bring my laptop to work, get a replacement, and then wait while our IT group worked on restoring my files from my hard drive if possible. Uh, I'd have lost a day or more of productivity. Instead, well, we've got a really good IT group, maybe it wouldn't have been quite that long, but it would have been, I'd have lost some productivity. So instead, I just set my laptop aside and I went to my desktop, one of my six other devices I could have used, I went to my desktop, I opened up my folder and kept working. And next time I get to the office, I brought my laptop with me. And guess what? He just gave me a replacement laptop. Uh, and I could just open it up and access my files. Think about it. It's just the, the gains in productivity, as Christine just said, are just incredible uh, that are possible with this type of technology. And the other thing is on the data protection side is most of these solutions support some level of versioning. So should there be a corruption in my file, I can just go back and restore from a previous version. Some have unlimited versions. Some allow IT to set the versions so that you don't have out of control data growth. So you can set how many versions are kept online. But when you combine this, you know, synchronized copies across multiple devices with the versioning, it'll be interesting to watch, you know, how that affects the endpoint uh, data protection, client side data protection side of the equation. Um, and then the other thing to keep an eye on is we're looking out for, for the, what are the customization opportunities that are out there. Um, how can we 
uh, integrate these types of solutions into SharePoint workflows or other, other types of workflows that are in the enterprise. Some companies like Box have very robust uh, API programs and integration programs. They're working with their partners uh, to, to, to build these products into uh, enterprise solutions and, and um, optimize business processes across, a, across IT. And we think that over time, these solutions will become fundamental application components. I mean, you know, think about it when you can think about the cost of, of, of storage in solutions like Salesforce. What if you can take some of that data and offload it into a, a, a you know, less expensive, highly protected platform like one of these online file sharing and collaboration platforms? Uh, the value prop becomes pretty powerful. So just just to wrap it up, and we'll we'll open up to questions in a couple of minutes. Um, but you know, this is if you can't tell, we think this is a pretty darn important market nowadays. And you know, this this market should, we assume is important to you too, just by the fact that you're here. I mean, we ask this question every year in our IT uh, spending intention survey. We want to know how much time IT spends keeping the lights on versus IT spends investing in, in strategic things. And and today you're spending. Uh, based on our research, two-thirds of your time just keeping the lights on, just fighting fires and fighting the day-to-day -day battles, just to keep the lights on and keep the business where it is today, and only one-third of your time uh, trying to move the business forward. And that really, truly is an unacceptable percentage and ratio of time. Imagine if you can free up your time uh, to invest in other things. Imagine the help desk requirements if you don't have to support the VPN anymore and all those file shares anymore, if you can just offload that into a cloud solution. Imagine if you just just, just being able to take advantage of these big data consumerization and cloud trends uh, to be able to do something different, and you can start really investing your time in and kind of swapping that equation a little bit and doing, doing things more strategic and a little bit less um, with regards to keeping the lights on. And you really are, just by the fact that you're on this call, uh, you, and, and digging into these topics and seeing what you can do differently. And you're the leaders that are, that are going to be out there to change this and to, to, to look at enabling the mobile workforce and, and, and jumping on these trends and, and, and uh, increasing productivity across the enterprise in a more strategic fashion. So I just want to thank you so very much for your time today and let you know that we, we talked about the market landscape report earlier in this call. Uh, we'd like to offer it to you. If you scan this QR code, you'll be taken to a page where you can access the market landscape report that we wrote on this uh, for free. It will require some registration. Um, and uh, we please send any feedback. You've got my and Christine's email and phone numbers up, up there. Uh, we invite any feedback uh, that you may have on the report or on this webcast or even questions. Feel free to ping us with questions because we'd be more than happy uh, to talk to any of you on the call today. Thank you for your time, and I think we're going to open it up for questions. Yes. Thank you, ladies. That was great. Um, we have quite a few questions from the audience. Um, one, The first question is, my company uses some pretty big Excel and PowerPoint files. How are these solutions with large file performance? That's, that, you know what, Caitlin, that's a really good question, and it's a question that I get, I get fairly often. Um, there are so many things that impact file performance, uh, probably the single biggest impact that you have is the bandwidth of your connection. So there's nothing that's going to be 100% all of the time for, you know, going to work for big files because it's because of the variability of that connection. Um, I can tell you that, interestingly enough, I was at an event last week talking to a bunch of people in the music industry that use, that share their, that, that use this in their production workflow uh, with their artists and their producers. Uh, and so my big question to them was, what's your experience with big file performance? And they were very, very happy with their solution. I found a large number of users actually using send it um, at, that, at that event, but a number of them used some other solutions too. Um, so it, it, the, big, the big issue there is, is your connection. Um, we haven't seen, you know, in my experience, I haven't, I've used some pretty large Excel files and haven't seen any performance issues. But there are things, if, if you routinely use very large files, there's some things that you can do a little bit differently um, if performance is a big concern, bandwidth is a big concern. One of the things I want to go to is Christine talked about uh, the deployment models. Uh, I know of some companies that, that have hybrid deployments out there where they've got uh, 
some of their data behind the firewall within the enterprise. And their mobile workforce is, you know, office resident mobile workforce. They, they typically sit in the office and then go out to the field. Um, so with their exceptionally large architectural drawings that are just, just, just massive, I wish I had the average file size with me, um, they serve up those drawings within the enterprise and they get land speed to download them to the mobile devices and then they get to take them out to the field with them on their devices. They can access them remotely if they want to. They just take a little bit longer to download, but that's how they handle those types of deployments. So you can start looking at different deployment models to meet your performance requirements, such as hybrid or behind the firewall deployments, if you're concerned about really large file sizes and you've got that type of workforce. Um, but, but the biggest limitation is is your bandwidth of your connection. I'll stop there one now. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, I am concerned about security. Can I run any of these behind my firewall? Another really good question. So the initial solutions that were out there were pretty much 100% cloud-based. Uh, and I'm going to go back to the deployment scenarios Christine talked about. Um, we're seeing uh, the emergence of solutions that are software-based that allow you to run them inside your firewall, uh, deploy them on your own storage, and, you know, you access them over, you know, via all your endpoint devices, but but you manage and maintain the storage and everything is is, is within your firewall and subject to your security parameters. Uh, people like Group Logic recently, in fact, as recently as last week, rolled out a solution that's 100% software-based. Um, SOS collaboration, I think, is software-based. Team Drive. So when you start looking at that list of vendors out there, uh, the initial vendors in the market, Box and Dropbox, uh, you send it are all services-based, but there's more and more solutions out there. They give you the choice of buying a service or buying the software. And even um, Ignite uh, has solutions that run within the firewall or outside the firewall that, that would support your local storage system. So um, there's more and more coming to address that. Great. Okay, the next question is, can you speak to why Box is in the upper right of the quadrant and Dropbox is in the lower left, as Dropbox has many more users than Box? It's a really interesting question. That's a great question. Um, we did that chart based on enterprise capabilities and functionality. And when you look at what, what Dropbox has, uh, Dropbox really is, has a, a design point focused on consumer support. They haven't invested the time into uh, developing uh, the administration con and control that so many of the others have when you start looking at, at, at what's required from the remote wipe and the remote uh, provisioning and deep provisioning and the active directory integration. When you start going down that really, really, really long administration and control and security checklist, okay, Dropbox, it's not that they're, they're lacking there, it just hasn't been their focus, so they haven't done it because they've got such, they've pretty much got their hands full trying to keep their 50 million consumer users happy with solutions that are targeted to keep that business running. And granted, they got 250 million in funding late last year, and, and it wouldn't surprise me to see them started investing in administration and control. But that chart was based on enterprise functionality and enterprise support capabilities, and Dropbox is intentionally not really invested in either. Box, on the other hand, uh, got about 81 million in funding about the same time, and, and uh, about 18 months ago, really started building out their dashboards, integrations. They rolled out the Box. Uh, Box Innovation Network, their developer network, and their APIs. They really, really, really focused on and made a concerted effort to address those things that Dropbox has not and, and start addressing the, the administration control and security uh, issues there. So Box may have fewer users, but they've made uh, the investment in the enterprise uh, support and functionality that Dropbox has. Okay, next question. Who has the best solution? <laughs> that's uh, a tough one. <laughs> yeah, Christine, that, that, that's a tough one. Because um, it's hard to say what's best because I'm not in your enterprise and I don't know what your requirements are. Um, the best solution for a company like ESG is probably not the best solution for a company like Procter & Gamble, which is probably not the best solution for uh, somebody in the U.S. government. So... Uh, that's why it's really important to go down this checklist and figure out what's important to me as an enterprise user. And when you get that filled out, the one with the most yeses that, uh, on the categories and, 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 and 
questions that are most important to you is going to rate who's the best solution for you. I mean, because there really is no no best out there uh, unless it's balanced against what your requirements are. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, what do you need, mean by hybrid options? Aren't these all cloud-based services? Uh, again, this goes this goes to the point that some are software that run behind the firewall. Hybrid's an interesting deployment model. Um, you can have some of your storage behind the firewall. There, there's some, you know, when you start looking at the security requirements, you could actually put, uh, you know, your certificate server behind the firewall and your data outside the firewall. So there's different types of models that you can deploy. Uh, some are all or nothing cloud. Some are all or nothing software. Some have multiple levels of hybrid deployment where you can put some stuff behind the firewall and some stuff out in the cloud. Again, based on your corporate culture and your corporate tolerance for risk, figure out uh, what's going to be best for you, and, and chances are somebody will be able to have that type of deployment model that's going to meet your um, corporate culture secure and security uh, requirements. But that's what I mean by hybrid. It's, it's, it's that ability to have some behind the firewall and some outside. Okay. Uh, well, it looks like we are out of time. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow on the ESG website at esg-global.com. Don't forget to scan the QR code. It's that black and white box on your screen. It will bring you up to a landing page, and you can register to receive a free copy of the Market Landscape Report. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you on future ESG webinars. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.